Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled From 16, Measuring the Hidden Burden of Family Impact of Disease. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Mappy Research Trust who developed the content for this presentation. Mappy Research Trust is a nonprofit organization that promotes the use of clinical outcomes assessments in health research and practice and encourages exchanges of patient-centered outcomes and COA information among academics, pharmaceutical companies, healthcare organizations, and health authorities. With the web-based platform eProvide that includes the databases ProCalid, ProLabels, and ProInsight, Mappy Research Trust has become the preeminent source of reliable, up-to-date, and comprehensive information about COAs. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Joining us today are Professor Andrew Finlay, Professor of Dermatology, School of Medicine at Cardiff University. Dr. Faraz Ali, Dermatologist, member of the Quality of Life team, Cardiff University. Rubina Shah, Research Fellow, School of Medicine, Cardiff University. Professor Sam Salik, Professor of Pharmacoepidemiology, School of Life and Medical Sciences, University of Hertfordshire. And Catherine Bottomley, Chief Scientific Officer of Vita Access, and also Marie Pierre Emery, Account Executive with Mappy Research Trust. But without further ado, let's go ahead and hand things over to our first speaker for today, Professor Andrew Finlay. You may begin when you're ready. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about uh, this hidden burden, the hidden burden that uh, family members of people with any disease uh, can suffer. Now, this is the conflict of interest statement concerning all of these speakers today. I think the main point to note is that both I and Professor Sam Salek and Dr. Catherine Bottomley are all uh, joint copyright owners of From 16. Next, please. So I'd like to speak to you about why this subject is so important. Next, please. As uh, Mappy Research Trust is based in France, I thought it was appropriate that we should start with a quote from a Frenchman, a uh, famous uh, mathematician and philosopher from the mid 19th century, uh, Antoine Augustin Cournot. And he said that if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Now, of course, that's not really true, uh, but uh, things do exist even if you can't measure them. But, in but when we think about the, uh, the, the impact that disease has on partners and family members, because up to now we've not really been able to measure it, it's, it's been ignored. And uh, it's just very little account has been taken of it. Next, please. So, my background is in uh, dermatology, and this is a photograph of a child with severe eczema being treated by a nurse. And of course, the focus of the uh, the focus of the slide is is the child. But what we want to concentrate on is the impact on the mother, the mother uh, who is holding this child in her arms. Next, please. So, how is how is her life being affected? And to answer, we became aware as, as dermatologists looking after small children with atopic eczema, we became, we became aware of just how much the parents' lives are affected by having a child with severe eczema. And we interviewed a large number of parents of children with eczema and found that housework, food preparation, sleep, leisure activities, relationships, family activities, a whole uh, financial impact, there were a whole range of things uh, that the <coughs> parents of the child with atopic eczema experienced. And from this, we developed the Dermatitis Family Impact Questionnaire. Now that, next slide please, that led us on to thinking that we, we need to make people more aware of this whole uh, concept of the uh, of partners and family members being affected and we proposed the concept of the greater patient the immediate close social group affected by a person having a skin disease so it's not just the patient who's affected by disease but it's the 
this greater patient, the people immediately around them in their lives who are also affected. Next, please. We then turned our attention to psoriasis and interviewed a large number of partners and family members of people with psoriasis. Again, we found a wide variety of ways in which these people's lives were affected. And in, all, in nearly all of these studies of uh, family members and partners of people with various diseases, what we found is that time and time again, people say to us, this is the very first time that any healthcare professional has ever asked us, uh, the patient's partner, the patient's mother, uh, about how this is affecting our lives. So that we, we like picking up a stone and finding what's underneath. Uh, again, if you start asking people about this, you find there's a huge burden out there. We developed the Sarasis Family Impact Questionnaire from, uh, from that study. And this led us on to realizing that this is a problem across the whole of dermatology. Next, please. We then developed the Family Dermatology Life Quality Index uh, with these 10 key questions, which we can use to identify the burden experienced by any, uh, by a partner or family member of any, uh, of a patient with any skin disease. And there've been about 40 studies using the Family Dermatology Life Quality Index. A, re a recent one assessed the impact of biologics uh, in psoriasis. Uh, the impact of biologics in psoriasis, mm -hmm. not only on the patient, but on the family member. Next, please. So uh, this drawing represents a doctor with a, a patient uh, sitting there, and the partner is also uh, very worried. You can see he's not happy either. And the work in dermatology led us to realize that this is a, an issue across the whole of medicine. It's not just confined to dermatology. It's clearly uh, an issue across the whole of medicine. And so we set about developing the family reported outcome measure from 16 that you're going to be hearing a lot more about over the next uh, few minutes. Next, please. So awareness of family impact in the clinic for a physician, this awareness may lead to closer engagement of a family member in their care. It may challenge the physician and other healthcare professionals to address this family impact. It, this may, uh, being aware of this issue, may result in enhanced drug adherence because family members, partners play a imp very important role in encouraging patients to stick to the appropriate um, therapy and help them with their therapy. Uh, it may give insights into whether additional patient support is needed, insights into whether to seek extra expert advice, and knowing more about the impact on the partners and family members may help us to take better decisions over reviewing patients and more appropriate decisions over follow-up and discharge. Those are the ways that uh, clinicians may be helped by having a greater understanding of family impact. Next, please. And awareness of family impact in clinical research uh, may, may lead to the ability to demonstrate the wider impact of novel interventions. It may lead to the ability to assess whether interventions aimed at helping partners and family members are effective or not. And it also may allow an evidence base for the assessment of the impact of interventions on partners and family members. So there's a, a huge potential value in clinical research of being able to measure the family or partner impact of disease. Next, please. And finally, and perhaps uh, most importantly, the awareness of the family impact of disease can be crucial in health economic analysis. Up to now, health economic analysis clearly has uh, taken into account many different impacts of disease, but there's been very little attention paid to this impact on the greater patient, on the partner and family member. And awareness of family impact and ability to measure family impact may lead to the ability to measure this wider burden or wider impact of disease this wider impact that's often un, 
unnoticed or ignored. And being able to measure this family impact may allow us to create a wider encompassing basis for the assessment of value-based health care. Next. Next, please. So in conclusion, the impact of disease on partners and family members is real. It is often massive and it's often, or nearly always, I should say, hidden or overlooked. And it can now be measured. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to pass on now uh, to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Catherine Bottomley. Catherine. Thank you very much, Professor Finley. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes introducing you to the FROM 16. So talking further about its development and its validation. And as with every new instrument that's developed, we started out by looking at what's already out there, what's been done before. And we have published the results of our literature review as a standalone paper. But just to summarise what we found in terms of existing family reported instruments, we found that existing instruments were either designed for those who identify themselves as a carer of a patient. So um, identifying those as providing some kind of aspect of care and potentially overlooking those who either live with a patient or have a relationship with a patient, but don't feel that they're providing any kind of formal or informal care. Other instruments were intended for one particular relationship, so commonly um, a child patient and the instrument designed to look at the impact on a parent of that child. And then we also found that some of the existing instruments were quite lengthy. And as Professor Finley has talked about, one of the aims of the instrument, the, the development of the FROM 16, was to be able to use it as part of clinical practice. Um, and so the length and complexity of some of the existing instruments didn't lend themselves well to this purpose. Next slide, please. So to introduce you to the FROM 16. So as the name suggests, the FROM 16 contains 16 items. Each of these items is scored on a three-point Likert scale, which gives us a score range of between zero and 32. When we developed the items for the FROM 16, we aimed to make these as simple and as comprehensive as possible. And that has positive impacts in terms of where and how it can be used, but also, as we'll come on to talk about, in terms of translation. The instrument can be completed in an average time of less than two minutes. It contains an immediate recall period, and the items are split into two domains, which is how they're scored. We first have an emotional domain, and we also have a personal and social domain. So now to take a step back and to think about how the instrument was developed. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the instrument development followed a fairly standard process. On the next slide, I will start by talking about the concept elicitation interviews. So we conducted concept elicitation interviews to identify the variety of ways that family members can be impacted by a disease. The first step in the concept elicitation interviews was the development of a semi-structured discussion guide. And we tested this discussion guide in a small pilot study before launching into the main interview study. You can see here that we interviewed 133 adult family members um, sampled across 26 different clinical specialties. On the surface, this seems like a huge amount, um, but there, there was a lot of reason and thought that went into um, selecting this number. So we were aiming to develop an instrument that will be applicable to family members of patients with any condition, a generic instrument. So we needed to make sure that we had good representation across all clinical, um, surgical and medical specialties. So we specified that we would speak to a minimum of five adult family members from each of these specialties. We conducted our interviews face to face, and then we monitored the saturation point of these interviews as they went on. So after interview number 40, no new significant themes arose. We also looked at the demographics of the family members that we spoke to. We noted that 93% were white British. We noticed this is a potential limitation as part of this study, which we are coming on to address in some future work. 
We also noticed that the majority were female, a partner or spouse of the patient or a parent. And on the next slide, I detail the 10 main themes that arose from these interviews. So here you can see the variety of ways that we identified that family members of patients can be impacted by disease. And these range from emotional impact through to the burden of their involvement in the patient's medical care, broader financial impact, impact on social life, impact on family relationships, sleep and health. A very broad um, range of subjects came up here. And on the next slide, I will take you through the process for item refinement and reduction. So just to spend a minute talking about the population that we used um, for, first of all, the item reduction and then the psychometric validation. So from the content of the interviews, we developed a first draft of the FROM, and this contained 30 items. And these were developed and taken directly from these qualitative transcripts. We then gave this 30 item from to 241 family members to complete. And it was the data from this that we conducted rash analysis on to help us to refine and reduce the number of items within the measure. We then gave the final 16 item from to 120 further family members. And we then conducted factor analysis and further psychometric validation on this data. You can see here that we use the step-by-step -step rash analysis process to refine and reduce the items down from 30 to 16. And just to summarize, some of the changes that were made during the rash analysis included, first of all, removal of low endorsement items. So those which were found to be less or least important when family members were completing the instrument. We also collapsed the response categories down from five to three. And we combined items that were found to have problematic dependency. So an example here is items relating to impact on family activities and hobbies. So moving on to the next slide, we then conducted our psychometric validation. So we started out by looking at some exploratory factor analysis, and that's how we identified our clear scoring factors for the instrument. We then moved on to assess content validity. So this was assessed both qualitatively and quantitatively with a group of family members and also with a healthcare professional panel. And we focused on item and response option completeness, clarity and relevance. We then moved on to test our construct validity. We developed two hypotheses and we tested these by administering the FROM16 alongside other instruments of interest. We found that there were moderate correlations between the FROM16 and the additional measures that we used to test the hypotheses. On the next slide, this details of the further psychometric validation that we conducted. So um, when we were investigating reliability, we started out by looking at internal consistency of the instrument. And the FROM16 had a Cronbach alpha of 0.91. And we then conducted a test retest analysis um, with a, a window of seven to 14 days between administrations. And again, the FROM16 performed well. We looked at the score distributions and the practicality of completing the measure. So we looked first of all for floor and ceiling effects. And then for interest, we looked at which were the highest scoring items by mean score. And these were emotional concepts, family activities, and impact on sleep. We also looked at whether there were any differences between the particular medical specialties that we sampled from. And we found that the highest overall mean scores for the instruments were seen in family members of patients from neurology, oncology, hematology, and chronic pain. Finally, we looked at the mean completion time for the FROM16, which as mentioned earlier, was under two minutes. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Faraz Ali, who's going to take you through the translation and cultural validation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Botnili, and for the kind introduction. <clears throat> so uh, I will be talking a little bit about our translation and cultural validation process. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about cross-cultural validation and some of the existing languages and some of the new languages coming up. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the translation process. Uh, we have a pretty uh, sort of strict regime in terms of how we follow uh, the translation process. Uh, essentially, it starts with two independent uh, translators who use the baseline 
uh, from 16, which was an English UK uh, version. Uh, and then that is uh, then harmonized to one uh, harmonized translation, uh, at which point two separate independent back translators uh, take it from the tar target language back into English, at which point that is then reviewed by Cardiff University. And then uh, that cycle continues uh, with Cardiff University and the translators until we have a uh, translation that reflects the original. Uh, Sometimes there may or may not be co a cognitive debriefing, but it is recommended uh, where the questionnaires is tested on uh, a small group of page, uh, subjects who will uh, test the final translation in terms of understanding and key concepts. Having done translations for, for many, many years now across various translations, uh, the two things I think that are quite apparent with translating from 16 is number one, the ease of translation, because it's such a, a simple questionnaire with very simple phrases. Uh, usually the the cycles are very minimal, uh, if uh, you know max one to two uh, cycles of checking and translating. Um, and I find that, and generally we found that as as a team that there are lower rates of conceptual issues. So uh, the questions are quite easy to understand and interpret. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about cross-cultural validation and what this entails. Of course, one of the reasons uh, measures are uh, important and they're successful at a global level is to make sure that they're relevant to various languages, various cultures, various populations. And so the whole language process is very important, of course, but also languages can be used in many different contexts in many different countries. Uh, some, something like, for example, Spanish or French, which may be used across many countries, uh, cross cross-cultural validation is extremely important. And the reason why uh, it is important is because it can highlight uh, culturally misunderstood or misaligned uh, issues or, or, or key phrases, and it can pick up key linguistic nuances and semantics, which sometimes can differ between different cultures and populations. And so in order to ensure that the FOM16 is culturally resonant and appropriate, cross-cultural validation is extremely important uh, because what it does, uh, this process captures uh, the intended information uh, from the affected population uh, to respect uh, local understanding and cultural differences. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview in terms of the existing languages. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have several uh, languages that already exist uh, uh, that can be accessed straight away uh, from some of the major languages in the world and some other major languages currently in development and hopefully should be available in the coming uh, few weeks to months. And the the, the, the demand really is quite considerable and uh, hopefully more and more languages will be coming in the near future. And I'd like to now uh, hand over to my colleague, uh, uh, Rubina Shah, who will go over the interpretation of Form 16 scores. Thank you, Dr. Faraz. I'm going to talk about interpretation of Form 16 scores, creation of meaningful score bounding. So although high scores of Form 16 indicate greater impact on family members' quality of life, descriptive bindings give meanings to absolute scores. Research has shown that utility of quality of life questionnaires can be maximized if clinical meanings are assigned to the questionnaire scores. Now, this is important because in absence of such interpretations, scores are just arbitrary numbers, leaving clinicians to guess the magnitude of the impact. Next slide, please. So we conducted online cross-sectional study between April and November 2021 with the aim of assigning clinical meanings to from 16 scores by creating score bounding. The participants were family members and the partners of the patients with different health conditions. Participants were recruited to 58 UK-based patient support groups, three research support platforms, and Social Services Department Wales. Involvement of the family members in the study, they completed from 16 questionnaire and a five point liquor scale question about the overall impact of the relative's health condition on their quality of life. Data analysis involved mapping of from 16 scores to GQ summary scores and sophisticated ROC AOC analysis. Next slide, please. So 
4,430 family members of the patient with more than 200 health conditions across 27 medical specialties participated in the study. As for relationship of the patient, family members to the patients, they were mostly spouse and partners, followed by parents and sons and daughters. When we look at the distribution of the family members across the UK, they were mostly from England and Wales. Mean from 16 score was 15 and mean GQ score was 2.3. Now it's interesting that these both scores are somewhat midway. That means showing already some degree of association between them, which was further consolidated through a strong correlation between the two. Next slide, please. Now this slide shows us the results of the banding. You can see in the first slide that we can see that from 16 scores is being mapped to GQ summary scores, and we can already see some various uh, possibilities of banding there. As you know, we have also done uh, ROC uh, analysis to find the kind of scores between the form 16 uh, and GQ bands. Based on these two types of analysis, we were able to devise following um, sets of bands and uh, best banding was chosen based on the weighted copper. Higher value of the weighted copper indicates greater alignment between the form 16 and GQ score. Here in this case, set D has uh, the maximum value for the weighted copper and therefore it was chosen as a final score banding. Next slide, please. Now in this uh, slide, we see a closer view of our final proposed banding. The effect mentioned here uh, uh, actually uh, refers to adverse effect on the quality of life of the patient's family members. Now that we have this banding, uh, what does it mean for research and practice? This banding has actually provided new information to researchers and the clinicians to interpret scores and score changes allowing better informed decisions for patients and family members. The cut of scores that resulted from this banding will help clinicians to identify at risk and high risk family members and direct them to the right kind of support. And finally, this score banding together with short administration time of the form 16 makes it ideal tool for research and holistic clinical practice. That was all about the banding. Now I will hand it over to Professor Salih, who will tell us more about current and the ongoing, ongoing, ongoing work on form 16. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rabina. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, you have already heard about the journey of uh, FROM16, um, its development, and some of the subsequent studies. And of course, now Rubina alluded to the interpretation of the scores, in particular, its utility in clinical practice. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm going to be sharing with you is really where from here and some of the uh, current and the future uh, studies that you know we have planned as part of our commitment to uh, the further development uh, and validation of from 16 next please the very first one that i like to uh, share with you is a study that has been completed uh, and it was published in the bmj <clears throat> recently um like everyone else or any other group of researchers when covid19 happened we were interested to see how from 16 can be applied therefore we uh, planned and designed uh, um, social media studies um, which was a global study uh, and we uh, had about 850 uh, patients uh, uh, across uh, different countries um, the details of course is in the in the publication and it's listed in the publication list that you have got in your handouts as well so the two message from this that i would like to share with you is that <clears throat> firstly the um partners and um of and family members of the covid 19 patients would quality of life was greatly affected in particular um you know they were worried uh, frustrated, uh, sad, and their family activities and sleep uh, was greatly affected. My second message is that, as you can see on the slide, the total score of FROM16 is 32, and as you can see, the overall score is 15. So that demonstrates the importance of measuring this impact. 
of uh, family and, and uh, partners of uh, those with uh, chronic conditions in particular. Um, and also, uh, as part of that, you will see that the personal and social domain of the From 16 contributed more to the total score, uh, which is 15 out of uh, 32. Next slide, please. Now, my two messages from this slide is firstly, um, the um, almost half of the family members uh, of those survival of COVID-19 that we um, examined were also affected or contracted COVID-19. My second message is that apart from the activities that are the usual suspects, such as the eating habits, uh, family activities, you know, holiday, sex life, um, the level of the impact on quality of life of those who were contracted uh, COVID-19 and those who did not uh, were virtually the same. So this suggests that the duties of the family member partners dealing with the caring uh, that they have to perform for the patients with a condition doesn't really change with the fact that whether themselves or also um, have got some disabilities or um, uh, mobility issues, etc. etc. Uh, next slide, please. So, as Professor Finley mentioned, in recent years there has been a greater emphasis on this neglected issue in terms of the economic value. Um, so, the both the um, formal and informal carers' contribution to the care of somebody with a chronic conditions or a disease um, is colossal. But what has been in the past measure is the cost of that formal carers, but the cost of the informal carers have been greatly neglected. As the health technology assessment agencies are putting more emphasis on including this in the whole economic issue, when they are submitting their dossier uh, for the reimbursement, we felt that perhaps this is our duty now that we have developed the generic measure from 16 to also pay a little bit of attention on how the scores of from 16 can be translated into uh, utility values. We therefore designed um, and executed a study uh, with that purpose in mind, uh, mapping the scores of the um, uh, from 16 into ut utility values and for this purpose we as um, uh, as, as uh, it has to be the case recruited something like 4300 um, uh, uh, patients families the patients of different conditions um, in order to be able to demonstrate both the internal and external validity of this mapping exercise this work has been now completed and recently submitted for publications and we hope that we can share that with you in the future the algorithm that we have developed, once the paper is published, we would be more than happy to share that with anyone who wants to apply this technique. Next slide, please. My last um, uh, issue that I want to share with you with the current uh, work of uh, FROM16 is a study that covers both the responsiveness of FROM16 as well as generating information to be able to calculate the minimal clinically importance or the minimal clinically change of the FROM16 over time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Although this slide may be a bit uh, complicated, but the design is very simple and straightforward. Um, on the left-hand side, you will see that the family members complete FROM16 and they answer a global anchor questions uh, which we want to use that for the minimal clinically important difference. And also they complete the FROM16 again three months later, which is the, for the purpose of looking at the responsiveness on the sensitivity of uh, detecting change over time. Um, now, the patients also been assessed uh, using the EQ5D um, uh, questionnaire. Um, and they also complete that at the beginning in the at a baseline and complete that again after three months. Um, 
we're hoping that this study will finish by the first quarter of uh, you know 2023 and hopefully we'll be able to publish that and be in public domain next slide please so my conclusion which is the general conclusion for the whole webinar on from 16 um and i would like to submit to you that the since the from 16 has been developed with the involvement of family members from 26 different medical specialities and other stakeholders such as patients and clinicians its inclusion could fill the gap that we have been talking about in clinical decision making as well as in appraisal of new treatment in clinical research to capture this hidden and ignored but very important outcome next slide please so what I want to really share with you without going through that in the in one by one um, is the list of publication that you can see on the three slides uh, this is also prepared for you in a handout which is downloadable um, on the on the webinar Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Marie-Pierre. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, hello, everyone. It's me. OK. Uh, so let's now talk about uh, some practical information surrounding uh, the conditions of access to the FROM16 and its translations. So. The University of Cardiff has appointed the Nonprofit MAPI Research Trust as the distributor of the FROM16 and its derivatives, such as translations. Therefore, the centralization of information uh, and translation of the, of the instrument, the licensing process, and the coordination of new translations and electronic versions are handled by MAPI Research Trust on behalf of uh, the university through MAPI Research Trust eProvide platform. So to know the conditions of use of the FROM16 and in your specific projects, we invite you to submit a request in uh, the MAPI Research Trust eProvide platform following the short process that is indicated in this slide. So you will first have to create your profile on the platform. This is a quick and easy process uh, as only basic information will be required. Then you will have to create your client account. Uh, and finally, you will submit a request describing your specific needs, such as which language version of the questionnaire you need uh, and for which type of project. Then an eProvide team member will reply to you within 48 hours uh, with instructions on the next step. Uh, uh, so that you can sign your license as soon as possible. So through our uh, eProvide platform, academic users who do not receive funding for their study will be able to download the questionnaire uh, free of charge uh, from the eProvide platform. So in the From16 web page of the platform, you will have to select the menu access this questionnaire in the left hand uh, side of the screen and then you simply follow the instruction and you will be able to download the language version you need if they are available. So here is a screenshot of uh, the description of uh, the from 16 on the eProvide platform and specifically on the Procolid database, which currently describes over 5,700 instruments with information on the contact, the conditions of access, the languages available, etc. So you can, uh, uh, Procolid also gives in-depth information about each, each instrument, including information on their development and psychometric properties. So what is the licensing process of the FROM16 for all users, uh, users than, uh, all other users, sorry, than not funded academic users? So you will have to submit a request in the eProvide platform. Once your request is submitted, the MAPI Research Trust will get back to you with the information you need for planning your uh, project. If you confirm that you will use the FROM16 in your study, you will be required to sign a master user license agreement 
uh, with my PFZR trust, as well as a work order specific to the FROM 16. Uh, then licensing fees will be calculated according to the type of license, so either study specific or an annual license, according to the mode of administration, so it's either paper or electronic, and also the category of users. Then you will receive, once so this process is completed, you will receive a permission for use uh, from MAPI Research Trust, as well as uh, the delivery of the requested languages version, if they are available. After the conditions of access, so let's now talk about the FROM16 language versions. So briefly, uh, so the original language of development was English for the UK. And as already mentioned, so there are current available translations that are listed here, but many others are uh, currently under development. So we advise all users to submit a request in our uh, eProvide platform uh, to get information, uh, detailed information about the existing translations and their, uh, their status and their availability. Besides the existing language version, what is the process for developing new translations of the FROM16? So first of all, for commercial users, uh, the new translation shall be produced exclusively by MAPI Research Trust's linguistic validation partner, ICON Language Services. A full linguistic validation methodology will be performed, including forward and backward translations, as well as cognitive interviews with patients uh, in collaboration with the University of Cardiff. So we advise you to contact us to obtain a proposal uh, for the linguistic validation of the FROM16 in the languages you need for your projects. For academic users, so academic translations in new languages will be authorized by MAPI Research Trust under the following conditions. So users will have to sign a master user license agreement and a specific work order with MAPI Research Trust. Then MAPI Research Trust will provide linguistic validation guidelines that must be followed by the academic uh, user, users. And then the final translation produced must be provided to MAPI Research Trust for distribution uh, to future academic users. Uh, it should be noted that all uh, derivatives of the FROM16, including new translations, are owned by the copyright holders. Regarding the process for electronic migration of the FROM16, so from paper to electronic format, so uh, for commercial users, uh, so a license and a work order uh, will need to be signed with MAPI Research Trust by all users. MAPI Research Trust and its partner ICON then shall review the screenshots of each electronic versions in order to check its content and layout and be able to certify the versions. For academic users wanting to migrate the questionnaire on electronic format, so academic migrations will be authorized by MAPI Research Trust. So again, the users will have to sign a master user license agreement and a specific work order with MAPI Research Trust. And then we will provide generic electronic guidelines to help the academic users to migrate the questionnaire uh, on electronic format. And again here, uh, it should be noted that all electronic versions of the FROM16 will be owned by the copyright holders. So to conclude, uh, should you have any uh, further questions on the FROM16, uh, we invite you to uh, visit the eProvide platform and the specific page of the FROM16 on this platform, and then submit a request in case you want to use the questionnaire in your study. You can also consult the specific page of the FROM16 on the website of the Cardiff University and we will be delighted to help you. So please do not hesitate to, to contact us to submit a request and ask any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. As we move into our Q&A session, I'd like to direct the audience's attention to the handouts module within the GoToWebinar control panel, where we'll find some additional documentation related to today's presentation to download for some further reading. 
I'd also like to invite the audience to continue sending their questions or comments right now using the questions window for this Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, I've already received some questions for you all, so we'll get ourselves started with those. First and foremost, uh, Dr. Finlay, we have someone wondering, have these measures that you discussed been used in mixed methodology studies, for example, uh, quantitative and qualitative? Well, I'm, I'm not aware of any publications describing them being used in, in such a mixed fashion, but there's no reason why they shouldn't be. I'm going to leave it at that. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, next, I've got a question, I believe probably directed to uh, Dr. Bottomley. It would like to know, um, if we consider the family impact of a disease, do you also suggest to account the actual and opportunity costs associated with it? Further, this can greatly increase the assessed cost of the disease. Do you consider this a potential cause of overestimation? And if so, what can you recommend to minimize it and which parameters of family impact should be mainly considered? <laughs> Gosh. A lot of questions and um, mm. I'll offer my thoughts and then I'll also ask my colleagues if they would like to contribute as well. So I think first of all it's worth pointing out that the From 16 is focused primarily on the impact on quality of life rather than the actual opportunity cost. Um, having said that the cost associated with family burden of disease um, is a real area of interest and as someone who works in pharmaceutical consulting I'm seeing this coming up you know a lot more amongst sponsors and clients. Um, in terms of which parameters to measure, um, I think I would always recommend an evidence-based approach to this. So if you're very lucky, somebody may have conducted um, some work already, some qualitative work and published it. So you may be able to find something that exists in the literature. But if not, I would always recommend starting with a piece of qualitative work to help to define those parameters, um, those areas of cost that are important um, to that particular group of people. Um, then to move on to the overestimation, um, I think a lot of this really depends on how the data on the family members is used or considered alongside the patient data. Um, overestimation is quite a complex subject when you're considering family members or carers. Um, when family members and carers complete instruments such as the FROM16, which are asking them about themselves, they can find it quite hard to separate the impact on the patient's quality of life from the impact on them. Um, so that's sort of one area of overestimation to consider. Um, and, and I guess that would then lead to potential sort of double counting of the patient burden when you're looking at the estimation of the family burden. Um, what we've done in the development of the FROM16 is attempted to account for this by phrasing the items to encourage family members to think about the impact of the patient disease on themselves. So we start our questions by saying, because of my family member's condition, um, just to try and focus their mind when they're answering those questions. And certainly within the cognitive debriefing exercise that we conducted, it became apparent that family members could or seem to be able to make that, that, sort of, that separation between the impact on the patient and themselves. Um, I just want to invite my colleagues to, to contribute to that and offer their thoughts as well. Well, I'll just uh, comment on the overestimation. Um, I suppose the, the most important thing is that whoever is assessing the data that's uh, produced uh, knows the, um, knows the uh, positive and negative aspects of whatever measurement technique is being used. So, um, <laughs> So it's, 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 important, it's important that there should be an understanding from the users of the data uh, over the potential, these potential issues. That's very interesting. Thank you very much for that insightful answer from you both. Now, I've got another question here wondering if there will be a Welsh language version. Well, I answer that oh. even though. I, even though I don't speak Welsh, <laughs> yes, there will be. Uh, uh, th there is a Welsh uh, language version under um, uh, be being created at the moment. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, now, the next question here says that many rare disease, or sorry, rare disorders impact children. The question is, have you thought about the impact on siblings and how we measure that impact?
I'm happy to start with that one. Um, just a comment to say that, yes, this is a hugely important area. And actually, when we were conducting the interviews with the family members, particularly with parents, a lot of them did mention independently themselves, you know, spontaneously, the impact on members of their family who were children, so commonly siblings. So, you know, we do recognise this as a another potential area of, of sort of hidden impact. Um, I think the the other short answer here is that it's it's not the from 16 is not designed um, to be completed by children. Um, I think it's very obvious to probably most people on this webinar that separate instrument would be needed to be designed, validated, etc. for this use. Um, but yes, certainly just acknowledging that you know this is a very interesting and um, an area that needs to be considered. Very good, excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question I have here would like to know why not use disease specific measures rather than the generic from 16? Uh, Andrew, would you like to, shall I go? And um, well, I mean, one of the reason that we felt, um, you know, a generic measure uh, would be of more value, uh, in addition to all those reasons that uh, Professor Finley mentioned uh, in his talk, uh, you know, we had looked at uh, several uh, diseases, specifically one, and we have developed a few one. Um, it, it, the, the, what was felt that there are quite a lot of overlaps, and and if you, um, you know, uh, want to have for individual diseases, as we said, you know, we. Um, um, included 26 different medical speciality you have to have you know more than that probably on the shelf to to be able to select one if there is one that has got a discriminant validity as the from 16 has that can comfortably be used uh, for different uh, condition and look at the family and, and and partner of different patients suffering from different diseases obviously it would be of more value but also in the context of the economic aspect uh, it's much easier to be able to generate utility values from a generic measure as opposed to individual uh, disease-specific ones. And, the, and just to add to that, there's another practical issue, and that is, uh, as uh, Catherine mentioned earlier, we're hoping that this may have some uh, be of some value in some direct clinical situations uh, to be dealing with literally hundreds and hundreds of different quality of life measures to, associated with each disease for their partner would be highly impractical if if you can if you if it's possible to use a a, a questionnaire which is actually valid across a wide range of different diseases from the practical point of view uh, it's much um, much easier very good, thank you. Our next question um, is wondering about the Chinese translation. They're curious if it's in Mandarin or Cantonese. Um, yeah, I'll I'll address that one. I I don't I don't believe um, uh, we know the exact details of that, so I will double check and come back to you. I believe it was um, uh, it was translated in the Zhengzhou University at China in China, uh, but uh, we'll double check that and get get back to you. Very good, thank you very much. Um, next question here uh, would like to know so there's 133 interviews which produces a lot of data how did you select the items for the first draft of the from i can take that one um yes it's a lot of data as the person who was doing the majority of the analysis of that data i can confirm that um how did we select the, the items for the first draft so um we selected these based on the themes within the qualitative data which occurred most frequently um, and then we balance that with those areas um, or those themes that family members described as being most important to them, those which they felt impacted them most severely. So it was a combination of those two aspects which led to the, the development of that first draft of items. Hey, Catherine, if I may just add to that, uh, which is an important point to consider, the key of selecting the items and the reason for having um, recruited 133 families of patients with different chronic condition is to be able to create something that it comes directly from those family members. So the ultimate um, questionnaire is really representative of what they have told us. 
but then in the process of mathematical modeling, trying to create something that's free of noise without trying to, um, you know, create, you know, give you more detail on that. Uh, that's all been obviously published. Uh, is try to constantly resolve that tension uh, between making sure something that is mathematically free of any noise, but also at the same time representing what the family members have told us. And this process is a very lengthy process that we adhere to going back and forth and making sure, despite the fact that we want to create something mathematically um, sound, uh, robust, but also at the same time, it really represents what the patient, uh, the families of the patients have told us. Very interesting. Thank you so much. So for our next question I have here, we have someone wondering, uh, do you have any plans to widen validation uh, using, using a wider range of ethnic backgrounds? Well, maybe I could just comment on this. Uh, we recognize the importance uh, of, of, of this wider validation. As Catherine emphasized, the uh, the whole creation of this measure was created uh, in here in in Cardiff, uh, and um, overwhelmingly uh, white uh, British people uh, were were the subjects who gave all the, all the information from which the questionnaire was based. So we do recognise the need to do wider validation. We haven't got any wider validation underway at the moment but this is something which uh, is on our list of things to do. Could I just add to that, um, Andrew? Uh, of course, our subsequent and current studies that, uh, you know, Robino in particular is uh, very busy doing is that um, the, the, I suppose, the scope of the um, inclusion of different um, patient, families of patients with different backgrounds um, it's been certainly wider than that, in particular, when we uh, looked at the um, mapping study, um, as well as the banding that Rubino presented, uh, because we used a, a very um, a large database, in that database there were more, uh, obviously, uh, inclusiveness in terms of uh, people different uh, different ethnicity. Um, but yes, that's something that obviously we will be continuing as part of our commitment to further development of PROM16. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that answer and for all of the answers today. However, we have reached the end of the Q&A portion for our webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, though, the team at MAPI Research Trust will follow up with you. Or if you have further questions, you can direct them to the email address that's up on your screen. I want to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit, and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now, I've also sent you a link in the chat box, and with this link, you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page, and you can also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording here as well, so I encourage you to do that. Now, please join me once more in thanking our speakers for their wonderful time here today. We hope that you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day, everyone, and thank you for coming.